Back in the times of this festivity, it was considered that at sunset one should turn off all lights, put out every fire and wait for the moment when the eldest priest would light up a special ritual fire in a special ritual place, and only after that that the fire might be lit in all other hearts. Some very strict laws insisted that the fire be lit exclusively from the sacred flame and shared among the rest of hearts. In the ancient times, in the era of the kings, on Celtic land, to light a fire before it was lit in the king's heart was considered a terrible crime, because it was thought that on this night the king should be the first to light the fire. Why this? Because there was a rule that stated that the first to lit the fire on Samhain has the right to power. And the right to power was granted only to those who were chosen by the gods, chosen by earth. Humans were not allowed to choose their kings. This was the rule of that time. People would only accept the will of the gods. They would only accept earth's will. Mother's son had left and would leave with the waning elements to other realms as the dark side in order to gather power, whereas his light side as the goddess husband and in the human form of the king would stay and lead the people. Priest, king and druid used to be one and the same figure. In those primordial times, a priest-king, a druid-king, were indivisible functions. They have been separated only later, and this has actually led to the creation and in many ways the appearance of other religions on our lands, when there has been a separation of these two functions. It was considered that on this very night the king holds a count before the ancient gods, as if taking an exam in regards to his impeccability. And it was considered that it is on the night of Samhain that the god Luh, the ancient god of light who supervised the fulfillment of sacred ancient rules, had the right to destroy the one king that he considered imperfect. And imperfect would be considered the king who during the past year broke his geishas, his obligations, who deceived, perjured and lied, or in other words, did all those things that in the ancient pagan world were absolutely inconceivable, especially on Celtic Scandinavian land as well as Slavic. Those places where untruth was considered to be the most terrible crime there is. And there was nothing that could justify a deceitful ruler, nothing. What else happens in Samhain Eve? Beltane speaks of this as well. On the eve of Samhain, on the waning of the earth element, one should not only be careful to light the right fire, but also to correctly behave himself. On Beltane, we spoke about a very important rule. Your personal force would awaken, and many provocators would come along asking you to give away something yours. Give me what you have. You have a lot whereas I have little. Give me what you have, share it with me. And we repeatedly reminded ourselves of this and emphasized it, that you have to be very considerate in order not to give away something yours, not to let anyone get their hands on what's yours, even those you call your own, even those you've known for ages. To safeguard what is being born within you and by no circumstances let anyone interfere with this process. Now, on Samhain, the situation is the opposite and the Samhain festivity tells us to give to all that ask. And there is a reason for it. On this night, like on every night of the Wheel of the Year celebrations, the boundary between the worlds becomes very thin. Why? 
Because at this moment, at these points of conjunction between spaces, it is as if we would halt a little at these points and start to synchronize with each other. Our world with another, our realm with other realms. Time stops there and time stops here. And it is not in vain that the moment of the festivities of the Wheel of the Year would be called the period of the timeless world. But it was particularly Samhain that was called this way. Because on this night, we not only synchronize with other worlds, with different worlds, but also with another world, the one we are always tied to. Simply that our world structure, our world's matrix, is structured in a way for the world of the departed not to be allowed to intervene in the world of the living. I am talking of the world of the dead, the world of the past ancestors. And there is only one night of the year when they are allowed to do so, that is tonight. And it was considered that anyone who would come asking on this night could be someone who came from the world of the dead and, as your ancestors would say, you cannot deny something to the dead. This is why anyone asking for something would be seen as an envoy from the other world. This is why the ancient forces and the ancient druids would say that you should give to all who ask on this night, whatever they ask for, give it to them. That is the origin of the tradition that later became part of the mystery of Halloween. When people in costumes go around the neighborhood shouting trick or treat, demanding what's theirs. This is a game form, an echo of that very action when anyone who entered your home on Samhain Eve could not be denied. It wasn't only the dead that could come to visit that night, but of course also the representatives of other realms. They too could come around with a gift or a request, and it was similarly forbidden to deny them a gift nor to refuse one. Therefore, this night's rule, this world's rule, is to give to those who ask without refusing. What else is important during this mystery? If on Beltane we did sing and dance and partied, extremely merry and extremely drunk, then this night it is all the other way round. Merrymaking is allowed, but only if it is not with people. And I will tell you about this. But if you are with people, if your path is the path of light, and magic has decreed that the care of your loved ones is to be laid upon you, then parting on this night was not only inappropriate, but contraindicated. Those who remained with people and the people who remained with the mages of the light path were intended to gather in one agreed-upon place, remaining there without sleep until dawn, without going outside. Gathered together by a druid lit bonfire, they would tell each other stories, share their life experience, gossip about their loved ones, because it was considered that on this night the dead would be near the living ones, dead family members, the deceased, and that they were very curious about their descendants and how they were doing. Therefore, it was customary to tell about one's life, again, gossip about those who are far, but you know how they are doing. On this night in particular, it was suggested to remember all those who are alive, not the ones who are deceased, the ones alive. And on this same night, 
It was important not to deny their request. This is why after Samhain Eve, you should necessarily leave food on the table for the deceased, on the banquet table. You must leave food for your ancestors. And this rule too didn't disappear during Christianity and transposed itself to cultural heritage like, for example, it did in the Slavic tradition. This rule, the festivity that goes by the autumn jade or Osenine, the night to feed the ancestors, when food for the departed progenitors would be left on the table. There is even one legend, or rather story, a story from the Celtic myths at the times Christianity came to Celtica. One of the annals of a Christian monastery tells the story of a monk, a monk that argued with the local population because they were celebrating this demonic Samhain festivity, saying that there are no dead ones, that they all have been taken by the Lord and are waiting for doomsday, which he wished they would do as well. But he himself by the words of his colleagues living in the same monastery, would never forget on Samhain Eve, he, the un uncompromising monk, to leave there, as if by accident, a jar with milk and a piece of bread, placing them closer to the hearth. Faith might be faith, but rules are rules. And those who work with and closely interact with the realm of otherworldly forces, should never forget that we are not alone here in this world, even though he would tell a whole different story to his parishioners. Slabs were also accustomed to feeding their ancestors and to gather with the entire family until midnight and even longer, telling stories about their life to one another. On this night, people wouldn't sleep. Falling asleep on this night was considered to be wrong. On one hand, because of fear, and on the other hand, out of respect to the arrived guests, your departed, deceased progenitors. And it was considered good manners to stay awake all the way until dawn. For this reason, they would read stories, read stories and sing songs, it was considered good to sing some monotone, melancholic chants, songs with no beginning and no end. You know, there are many of them like that in Ross, there are actually many in every folklore, to burst into a song 72 verses long, and you can consider the time to be spent, spent well together. In other words, they would do anything as long as it would keep them together. But the forces of the light priests knew that this wasn't the only reason to act this way. Fact is that the doors that open on this very night would lead not only to the world of the dead, but also to all other realms. And the encounters would not always be pleasant and joyful. The also terrifying wild hunt that begins on Samhain Eve would get free access to our world and all the way until you, the wild hunting would take place on the streets of our human world. And this is actually what they were most afraid of. Why would they fear this more than anything? Simply because the wild hunt, the ancient cavalcade of the ancient deities, was composed of these very rejected, desecrated and slandered gods. It was called the Odin's army, the army of goddess Holda, the army of God Sir Nunos, Devil's Army, that is what they called it in Middle Age Europe. Many are the names, and each name would remind people of the fact 
that the ancient gods didn't go anywhere, and that the dead are not the only ones with the right to once a year visit the place of their former life or the families of their descendants. But the ancient deities, too, would leave their paths, their dark paths in parallel worlds and would come treading the roads of our world. Woe to the one who in the night encounters the wild hunt. Woe to the one who will look into the eyes of the ancient gods. Back then it was considered that they would take the misfortunate with them. The wild hunt punished betrayers and apostates. The wild hunt would punish those who took part in the unrighteous, ignoble acts of lies, exchanging his own gods for foreign ones, agreeing to call them horrible names, agreeing with the fact that his gods, the ones who always helped him, his blood and kin, are to be considered enemies, slandered and defamed. Now, 